reading, passage from 2 Peter, who said, we have also the prophetic message as something completely reliable. Now the background of this is that Peter has been saying, we were eyewitnesses, I've seen it. I saw Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. Of course, you didn't. I was the only one who did it. You didn't see that. So, we have the testimony of Scripture, the prophetic message is something completely reliable, and you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will. The prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Now with that in mind, a few years ago, the BBC carried a program called The Bible Hunters. And this chappie here on the right wandered around various places in the Middle East talking about the Bible and saying just how dreadful and unreliable it was and how you can't trust the Bible. And the program made me fume because it was very much a case of is the glass half empty or is the glass half full? The facts that he quoted were absolutely true. It was the interpretation that he put on the facts that was the difficulty. So I want to look at three of the questions that were raised by his program and try to answer them. The first is, is the Bible text reliable? Or is it, as he said, full of mistakes? <coughs> well, the answer is that we have hundreds, if not thousands, of Greek documents. It's known as the Textus Receptus, all these different documents. They first came to our attention thanks to dear old Erasmus, who set out to make a new translation of the Vulgate, of the Latin Bible, and just at this time, Greek texts were coming into, the, into Europe, and so he thought, I'll have a look at them. And he found it so fascinating that instead of publishing a version of the Vulgate, he published a version of the Greek. Mind you, he still had the Latin name with it, but this was the first edition of the Greek. And as he went through, he discovered that the Textus Receptus was full of mistakes. Now, actually, he was only dealing with one family of documents. There are two families. The one he was dealing with was the Byzantine family. Now, what do I mean by family? Well, every week, just about, I write a letter to my relatives in Australia. And suppose I wrote to them and said, Thursday was grey and gloomy, and we, we, we did this and that thing, but it was grey and gloomy. Mm -hmm. Now, my wife, who's a very busy lady and doesn't have time to write, Let's say she copies my letter and sends it to her side of the family, but she doesn't know it wasn't a gloomy day. It was grey, but it wasn't gloomy. So she just leaves out the word and gloomy. Now my relatives copy my letter and send it out to all their friends and family on Facebook or whatever. And Shirley's relatives copy her letter and send it out to all their relatives. Mm -hmm. You come across one of these letters and you could tell instantly whether it was from the Down family or the Pi family because the Down family has the word gloomy in it. The other one doesn't. So this is why you can say there are families of documents. The Byzantine family of documents, the other one is known as the Alexandrine. It was not available to Erasmus, he didn't know about it. So as I say, he found that there were a whole class of errors in these Byzantine documents. And you think, oh dear, there's mistakes in the Bible. <gasps> well, I want to show you what some of these mistakes are. For example, here is a mistake made by a copyist, and they were only human. This is known as haplography. Can you see the mistake? In other words, the two letters up there have been missed out. E-R, E-R, the bloke's copying it out, and he just skips over, he misses out. Two letters. Well, it's pretty easy to, to, to detect, you know. Here's another one. Dittography. And again, I don't know whether when you were at school you had to do um, copying out of the book or dictation from the teacher. I made that mistake myself, you know. Just hmm. Here's another one. Metathesis. 
Sometimes the whole word will be completely reversed. And here's one. Again, I've made that mistake myself. Can you see why? Because there are two lines beginning and Paul and Paul. And it's late on Friday evening. The bloke's been copying in a cold scriptorium. His fingers are cramped. He's getting on for dinner time. He's starving hungry. And he's just jotting away. And his eye skips from and Paul. Yes, I've done that line. And he goes down to the third line. Various rules, the scholars have drawn up various rules, one of which is that the more difficult reading is probably the correct reading. If, I, if, you, if you talked about going a boat, you would go in a boat, wouldn't you? So no scribe writing down things carelessly would say, upon a boat. You know, you don't go upon a boat. So probably upon a boat is the original text, because why would anyone put it in carelessly? They would say in a boat. So the more difficult reading is probably the correct one. A second rule is that the shorter reading is more likely to be correct, because scribes are more likely to add in a word or two by way of explanation, rather than, than drop things out, unless it was pretty obvious that they were dropped out. So the shorter reading is more usually correct. And finally, the older reading is correct. So, as I say, when this TV presenter made this comment that the Bible text is full of mistakes, it is. But that doesn't detract from the accuracy of the Bible, because when you take all these thousands of documents and put them together, it's pretty obvious where the mistakes are, these little scribal errors, and you can easily edit them out and, and come up with the correct text. It's not a reason for rejecting the Bible. But, by saying that the older documents were the more likely the more accurate, you answer another question, which is, has the Bible text been changed? And this again was something that this presenter tried to put across, oh, you know, the, the Catholics, you know, they've changed the Bible to make it say what they wanted to support, the Pope and all this sort of thing. Well, has the Bible text been changed? And by going back to the oldest documents and looking at them, comparing them with the more recent ones, you get the answer to the question. So, once this principle had been decided upon, the search was on to find the oldest manuscripts. And one of the scholars involved in this was a man called Tischendorf, who was, I think, a Russian. And he went to St. Catherine's Monastery out at Mount Sinai. I've been there numerous times. It's, you know, six hours, seven hour journey in an air conditioned coach from Cairo. But of course, he didn't have an air-conditioned coach. It took him two weeks on camelback <laughs> in the boiling heat. And when you get there, the only way in, the, the, there is a gate now, but there wasn't then. They blocked it up to keep the Arabs out. The only way in was through one of these, where they let a rope down. And you know the old joke, how often do they replace the rope? When it breaks. <laughs> So he had to be there and you know, stand at the bottom, they lowered a basket, they climbed in the basket and they pulled him up and, and, and he started studying the documents in the library, looking for one. And the famous story is of how he'd found various interesting manuscripts and one day he was on his way up to the library and he met a monk coming down with a basket full of uh, scrap paper. He said, oh, what have we got there? Oh, then just the scrap paper I've taken down to the kitchen so they can you know, use it for kindling to start the fires. Oh, he said, can I have a look? Yeah, help yourself. So he had a look and <laughs> he recognized it as a very old manuscript. He said, I'm going, could you get some other books? I'm going. He says that the monks told him, oh, well, you know, it's a load of rubbish. You can have it. You, if you want it, you can have it. The monks say, we loaned it to him. Whatever the case, he took it back to Russia and he presented it to the Tsar. It was the oldest copy of the uh, Bible, the Old Testament, that is known. It's known as the Codex Sinaiticus. When the Tsar was overthrown in the Russian Revolution, the communists had no use for the Bible, so they were going to destroy it. And the British said, we'll buy it off you. And the Russians said, we want a million pounds for it. A million pounds back in 1917 was serious money. And the British government said, here you are. And you want 99 pence as well. <laughs> it's now in the British Museum, one of the great treasures of the British Museum. So there's this old, old document comprising almost the whole Bible, 
and you can compare it. Have there been any changes? No. None that you've noticed. It's known as an unseal because it's all written in capital letters. <laughs> and it's wonderful because there are no spaces between words, no spaces between sentences. So, you know, it does lead to a certain degree of um, capabilities of interpretation. <laughs> but you can read it and see that there have been no big differences. In fact, it's not just in the Greek, uh, in, in the big manuscripts. This is the oldest Bible, uh, New Testament manuscript known. It's John Ryland's Papyrus P52. And you can go along, as I have done, to the Manchester Library, the John Ryland's Library, and ask to see this. When I first went along, it wasn't on display. They had to fetch it from the storeroom for me. And they very kindly allowed me to photograph it. But you can get much better pictures now off the internet, which I did. Now, the interesting thing about this is that the scholars were able to read it and say, oh yes, this is part of the Gospel of John. Now, by saying... Right, this is from a particular passage, that first line. The second line, that gives you an idea of how long the lines were. Because you break the text up into, into the as it's shown there. So you count up, and you then turn the page over, and you keep on going, and sure enough, it comes out <coughs> exact. So exact that we can even say that the scribe made a mistake and left out one word. <laughs> by, by counting. So in other words, there's nothing. There hasn't been anything added or taken away, apart from this one mistake that has been missed out, and it's obvious that it's been missed out. The Bible hasn't changed, and this was written within about 30 years of John's death. You don't get much earlier than that. And as far as the Old Testament is concerned, well, here in Cairo is the Ben Ezra Synagogue, and uh, I, I've been there. You go inside and upstairs on the balcony over here, there's a hole in the wall, and there the Jews dealt with a problem. Now, I don't know what you young people do, probably just uh, you know, when your Kindle wears out, you throw it away, even if it has got a Bible on it. But some older folk get very thingy. What do you do with a Bible that's worn out? <coughs> you know, the pages are loose and are falling out, and the cover's been patched with sticky tape. And what do you do with it? Well, it seems a little bit blasphemous to throw it in the rubbish bin, doesn't it? So what do you do with it? Well, most people I know press a few flowers in it and keep it on the bookshelves and buy another one. They never actually throw it out. That's left to their heirs and descendants to do. But the Jews had the answer. When you had a book, a scroll, a Bible document that was so old that you just couldn't use it anymore, it was falling to pieces, you brought it here and you dropped it down inside that room. Mm -hmm. It was part of the synagogue, it was all very holy, and the fact that the white ants and the mice chewed at it, and, you know, eventually it disintegrated to dust, well, at least you hadn't thrown it away. So this is known as a Galitza. And back in the late 1800s, a man called Solomon Schechter from Cambridge went there and discovered this Galitza and said, oh, can I, have, can I climb in? Well, he had to climb up a ladder to get him through that hole. And he found himself knee-deep in musty manuscripts and sorting through them by the light of a candle. He stirred up so much dust that the poor bloke got a fungal lung infection that later killed him. <laughs> but the documents that he found, and you'll see him studying some of them, and they have been a treasure trove of very early Bible manuscripts. And they sort of roused interest. This, this was an exhibition where some of them were taken from Cambridge over to America. And people flocked to see them because they were so interesting and so valuable. And some of the documents have been found are, are very long. In fact, the longest ancient document that has been found is the great Isaiah scroll, which was found in Qumran and dates back to 100 years before Christ. And the scholars have never bothered to translate it. Do you know why? Because you have it here. Mm -hmm. There are no differences. Uh, maybe a, a spelling mistake or two, you know. A bit of ditography somewhere or other. <laughs> or haplography. They, they haven't bothered to translate it because it is the same. The Bible has not been changed over the years. And we can have confidence that the Bible we have today is the Bible that was written by the prophets and apostles of old. So the third and final question is, ah, 
But what about all the books that were left out of the Bible? You see, the Catholic Church is very selective in the ones that brought in. It left out a lot of good stuff. And we knew that there were books that had been left out, but we didn't know what they were because they, they vanished. Until some archaeologists came to this place called Oxyrhynchus in Egypt. Now, Oxyrhynchus, the modern village, is down here by the riverside. But the ancient village was up here, out in the desert. And that's significant, because the desert is dry very, very dry, and that means that ancient documents have been preserved. And so here you have the site of ancient Oxyrhynchus, and the scholars who went there to excavate it, they didn't bother excavating the houses. They weren't interested in the houses. They went straight for the outside for the <coughs> rubbish heaps. Now I've done a bit of excavating, and I can tell you that when you find a rubbish dump, you struck gold. Because everything, you know, the houses are all nice and clean and tidy because they've had housewives looking after them and you don't find anything in them. But you go out to the rubbish dump and then you find the broken lamps that the wives threw out. And you find the broken pots that the wives, the housewives threw out. And you find, well, you, you just find everything. So these uh, two men, Wilfred Grenfell and, uh, oh God, I can't remember the other chapter name. They went there, they started excavating the rubbish dumps, and they struck gold. Because all the old, worn-out documents had been dumped, and they found them. And what a treasure trove they found. There were tax receipts, students' exercise books, personal letters, lost manuscripts. Now, this is a lost manuscript of the Greek mathematician Euclid. Complete for the diagram. <coughs> I don't know what theorem he was proving, but you know, there, there it is. Here's a biblical manuscript. This is part of the Gospel of Matthew. All sorts of things have been found. Now, this is one that's particularly interesting. Uh, it's now in the British Museum, of course. And it's a letter from the prefect of Egypt. There were those who said, the Bible story is a load of rubbish because the Romans never expected you to go back to your hometown for taxation purposes. So when the Bible says that Joseph and Mary had to go back to Bethlehem, it's just somebody making up a story in order to explain, you know, to make Jesus' birth fit in. So here is a letter from the governor of Egypt in which he says, Prefect of Egypt declares, the census by households having begun, it is essential that all those who are away from their gnomes, and gnome is what we would call a shire, be summoned to return to their own hearths so they may perform the customary business of registration and apply themselves to the cultivation which concerns them. Knowing, however, that some of the people from the countries that are required by our city, I desire all those who think they have a satisfactory reason for remaining here to register themselves before Bulas Vestas, the cavalry commander whom I have appointed for this purpose from whom they will receive a, a permit. So in other words, in the place next door to Palestine, people were expected to go back to their hometowns for taxation purposes. It's obvious that Joseph couldn't come up with a good enough reason for staying where he was. He had to go back to Bethlehem to register. So, you know, it, even the details of the Bible, I mean, in fact, we actually know from another document the questions that Joseph was asked. Isn't that the sort of thing that you'd have to answer in a census these days? Right? The name of the property owner, age, occupation, wife's name, name, ages of children, name, name, ages, and occupation of others in the property, description of the property, tax assessment, that's the important point, and then the signature of the date. Even more important than the actual documents that were found was the language of those documents. Now, the Greek of the New Testament, you won't realize it, I don't realize it, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, not a Greek scholar. But it is so different from classical Greek that the um, scholars said, well, you know, this must be a special sort of Greek used by the Holy Spirit. And they actually called it Holy Spirit Greek. But the point is that between classical Greek and the time of Jesus, there's 400 years. How many years are there between the King James Version and uh, today? And today we no longer say thee and thou like the King James Version does. The language has changed. Greek changed as well. And so now we know that the Koine Greek 
of the New Testament is just the everyday Greek of people at the time. It's not special Holy Spirit Greek at all. It's just the ordinary language of the people of the time. And the result is that many hapax legomena, I'm sure you'll be delighted to hear this, that many hapax legomena are now understood because they're found in the power right. Isn't that a good weight off your minds? Yeah, I'm glad to hear it. I don't know whether you've ever tried reading a book in another language that you're trying to learn, and you come across a word that you don't know. But because of the context, you can make a guess at it. And particularly if in the next paragraph you find the same word in a slightly different context, that will help you to refine its meaning. And when in the two chapters further on you find that word again in a third context, you've got it nailed. But a hapax legomena, where they get these names from, I don't know, is a word that only occurs once. And there are a number of these words in the Bible that only occur once. And the scholars have to make a guess at what they mean, but you can't be sure what they mean. Because, you know, every language has exceptions. But the hapax legomena in the Bible you will find these words used in some of the documents found at Oxyrhynchus in different contexts, and now you can say, yes, now we know exactly what that word means. For example, one word that wasn't clearly understood, even though it isn't the hapax legomena, is the word parousia. And the Jehovah's Witnesses make a big thing out of this. Oh, it's the invisible coming of Christ. It means invisible coming. Yes, yeah, absolutely. But when you take all these other documents, it means something entirely different. It means the visible presence of the king when he pays a state official visit to your town. If he slips in to have a drink in the bar, that's not a parousia. But if he comes with his army and trumpets blowing and dancing girls dancing before him, that is a parousia. Another place where documents were found was Nag Hammadi. There it is. And the archaeologists weren't terribly interested in it. It was left to this man digging in his field to find a jar. And in the jar were some old books. Well, he couldn't read them, but he thought they might be useful, you know, flog them off for antiques to the tourists, so he, he took them home. And unfortunately, his wretched mother needed some kindling for the fire, and she burnt one of these books before he had a chance to sell them. That, I think, is why she's hiding her face, because she realizes that she burned a fortune. <laughs> the books are so valuable. Here's one of them, as it was found. Since then, they've been studied and uh, renovated. They turned out to be a Gnostic library. Now, the Gnostics were Christian heretics, and we had some vague ideas of what they taught, but it, here we have the actual documents setting out their teachings. And it's so interesting to read what they actually wrote. The Wikipedia, from where I got this picture, says that this is a, a page from the Gospel of Thomas. It isn't. It is, yes, the Apocryphon of John, right? According to Ioannin, the Apocrypha. Uh, but uh, it gives you an idea. Now, in this Gospel of Thomas, there are various sayings of Jesus. Here's one. His disciples said to him, is circumcision useful or not? Jesus said to them, if it were useful, their father would produce children already circumcised from their mother. The true circumcision in spirit had become profitable in every respect. Here's another one. Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is like a shepherd who had a hundred sheep. One of them, the largest, went astray. That's a detail you don't get in the Gospels. <laughs> He left the 99 and looked for the one until he found it. After he toiled, he said to the sheep, I love you more than the 99. And here's an interesting one. The kingdom of God is inside of you, and it is outside of you. When you come to know yourselves, then you will become known, and you will realize that it is you who are the sons of the living Father. But if you will not know yourselves, you go to poverty, and it is you who are that poverty. And again, I am the light that shines over all things. I am everything. From me all came forth and to me all returned. Split a piece of wood, and I am there. Lift a stone, and you will find me there. That's a bit dubious theologically. Are these genuine sayings of Jesus or not? The answer is I don't know. They may be. Because we do know from the Bible that many of the things that Jesus said and did 
are not recorded. Okay, this is from the, the Gospel of John, who says that uh, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. So a lot of what Jesus said has been left out. It's possible that some of that. But the same applies to the Old Testament. Some of the things that uh, were written have not come down to us. Even some of the things that were written by prophets have not come down to us. Now, one of the books that has been left out is called The Shepherd of Hermas. And The Shepherd of Hermas, you can find it online if you want to put yourself to sleep. The Shepherd of Hermas is apparently a, uh, it was written possibly by Hermas, who's mentioned in the Epistle to the Romans, and it's possibly a collection of his sermons. It was regarded as part of the Bible for many years, but finally it was dropped out. And I am ever so glad that it dropped out, because after all sorts of parables and, uh, you know, you think, well, you know, this isn't too bad, maybe this should be in the Bible. In the final chapters, it tells you all about the winds. I'm going to tell you, says the author, how God has arranged the winds. You see, all around the world, there are these big high walls, as high as mountains, with brass gates in them. And every so often one of the angels leaves the gate open and the winds come rushing out and that's when you have a storm. And you read that and you think, boy, whew, I am glad this is not in the Bible. And the same can be said of any of the apocryphal books. You read these apocryphal books, the Infancy Gospels, the Acts of Paul, the second of the Gospel of James, the Acts of Pilate, the Apocalypse of Paul. Do you know Paul was taken down to have a look at the sufferings of the damned in hell and he felt so sorry for them he begged of God to give them a little bit of a break. And God said, well, I wouldn't do it for everyone, Paul, but seeing as you're the beloved apostle, I'll let him have every Sunday off. You'll be glad to know that the damned in hell get every Sunday off. Mind you, later on, Mary um, was taken down to hell, and all she could get was one day a year off. So obviously Paul is more important than Mary. <laughs> you know, they, you read them, and as you read them, you say to yourself, yeah, I can see why this was left out. Not because it... it teaches doctrine contrary to Catholic doctrine, but because it is a load of rubbish, pure and simple. So, what conclusions can we draw from all this? Well, the first conclusion we can draw is that the Bible text we have today is reliable. We can take it and read it knowing that it is as near as, darn it, the text that was written by John or Matthew or Mark or Luke or whoever. The second is that textual variations, the mistakes that this man made so much of, are to be expected and they don't amount to a hill of beans, they're not a cause for alarm. They're simple little scribal errors that can be picked up and sorted out without any difficulty. And the third is that the Holy Spirit guided the church which books to select and which books not to select. Now when I say guided the church, I don't mean guided a whole lot of bishops in conclave. That is not how the Bible was selected. People got these books and read them and said, this is good stuff. And you find different early church fathers drawing up lists of books that are accepted in the church. And it was only later, after these lists had been drawn up, that the church had a council and officially said, these are the books. But the canon, as it's called, the scripture had been selected already by the church, the body of believers. And the Holy Spirit guided the body of believers. Not sure whether the Holy Spirit guides the officials of the church. That may be a debatable question, but the Holy Spirit certainly guides the body of believers to come to the right, connect, right, uh, uh, right decisions. So, read your Bible with confidence. It not only tells you, as we were studying this morning, disreputable stories through history, but it also points us to the future hope, to the God of heaven, whose throne is above all things.